Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the importance of building diversity in the arts, and particularly in the performing arts with guests. Everett McCorvey, Professor and Director of Opera at the University of Kentucky College of Fine Arts, and Jose Luis Valenzuela, Artistic Director at the Latino Theater Center. So thank you, Everett. Thank you, Jose Luis, for joining us. It is wonderful to have you. And particularly because of what I have just experienced, I've apologized for it, we'll go over over that. But before we, we, we uh, talk about that particular uh, situation, um, I just wanted to sort of tee this up because uh, racial and ethnic demographics of the uh, paid arts uh, workforce, it's just strikingly similar to what it was generation ago, two generations ago, three generations ago, with a majority identifying as non-white. And the audience mix also frequently follows the same pattern and there must be changed to be more inclusive. So I recently was personally involved in a situation and, uh, and I received its share of press attention and we'll talk about that. But before we do, let's talk about how you each have experienced disparities in the arts based in race. And, and Everett, do you mind uh, teeing this off? Because it's, it's, it's just such an important topic. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me on this uh, important uh, webinar, and uh, I appreciate all of your uh, efforts to raise the discussion about these areas. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with uh, several major nonprofit organizations. In addition to my work as director of opera at the University of Kentucky, where we are almost an independent uh, company with a budget to uh, present uh, world-class opera. I'm also the founder and director of the American Spiritual Ensemble, which is a uh, a performing uh, choir that performs all over the world and celebrates the American Negro spiritual. And uh, I'm also the artistic director of the National Chorale in New York City. And so I've had a lot of experience and work with diversifying uh, organizations and helping to answer this uh, question about how one uh, diversifies the arts and addresses the systemic racism that still happens uh, in the arts. And so uh, I'm looking forward to talking about that. You know, this is such a, it's such a big problem, isn't it, Jose Luis? you've had a, a career arc where you've seen so much. Uh, talk about what you have seen in your in your arc and how you are addressing that. Yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Yes, I, I work with big white institutions and internationally work as a director and I have the Latino Theater Company for 35 years and I'm a distinguished professor from UCLA from the School of Theater, Film and Television. So as you know, it's been a big, amazing journey and experience in racism and seeing how difficult it is to bring people of color. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even mean, I, I was the head of the MFA directing program for 25 years. I think I had one African-American student in my, in my program in 25 years, okay? And five Latinos. And I think it's so important to talk about how the system it's all designed to not bring people of color into it. And, and also, I mean, we have to talk about the educational program, the, the actual educational system that is based on all Western culture. It doesn't allow any relationship to the communities that we're talking about in many, many, many ways. I think it's really, it's so, and it's an old fashioned educational system. It was designed in the 1950s. And it haven't changed it's 60 years ago, if not longer than that, especially in the arts. I'm talking, about, you know, especially in theater and, you know, and in film, if you want it. So I think the work that we have to do as leaders in the community, as leaders in the academia or in the nonprofit work is immense. I mean, it's not easy. I, mean, I want to talk a little bit about what happened with you because it happens with all this coded language that exists. In, in, our, in, our, in our work, in our world, and that we have to analyze and take them away because if not, that's what the what we call the gatekeeper for people of color coming into the performing arts. Yeah, and this is where, where we stumbled. Um, we, um, we took a point from 
their position descriptions into into ours. It should never have uh, made it through the filters. We focused elsewhere. Uh, we edited, you know, the first couple of pages, and then it was brought to our attention. We didn't even recognize the words. Um, and then when when we kind of figured it out, which happened at about um, uh, 12, 12.30 in the morning, um, a few hours later, we we together actually with uh, the principals uh, at our clients um, put that down. Um, and it's it's it was a, a lapse. If I say anything more, it'll sound like an excuse. It isn't. I take, I take full responsibility. So the question becomes, as a perpetrator, I am a perpetrator. Okay, I am a problem. How do I make a change? How do you make a change? How do we make a change? How does the system make a change? Everett, opera is as, is as bad as ballet, as bad as theater, as bad as the symphonic arts, as bad as the museum sector. Every single sector has to change. How do we deal with this, Everett? Well, I want to go with something that uh, Professor Venezuela said uh, when he talked about the gatekeepers. One of the things that we have to do is we have to have more gatekeepers who are diverse. Part of the problem that I have seen in opera for years is that you may have a few operatic singers, but you have very few opera administrators. And so diversity has to be intentional. It can't be happenstance. It has to be planned. And so, but if there are no gatekeepers who are diverse, then it makes it difficult to change the system because there's no one in the system that then realizes that there must be change. And so if there are people in the system who are gatekeepers, who can look at language and say, wait a minute, this is racist language, who can look at auditions and who can look at opportunities and say, we must have a diverse cast. We must have people of color in the decision-making positions so that we can identify systemic racism when it happens. Because as you were saying, Mark, part of the problem comes in that sometimes people who are, a lot of times, people who are in those decision-making positions, they're okay with the language. They don't see anything wrong with the language. And so, Unfortunately, what then happens is like what happened uh, uh, with your organization. But one of the ways to change that, obviously, is to get more diverse gatekeepers, more diverse people who are in decision-making positions, and then empower them to make those decisions. Jose Luis? I, I think it's so important. Yeah, it's very, very important. I mean, I think that's key for most organizations. I, I work at the Music Center. I work in big theaters all over the country. And that's the biggest issue that you encounter. One, you in a nonprofit organization like ours, you have to diversify your board. And it's so important. It's so important. And not only in the idea that and they have this because well, not you know they they look for the people who can give you big checks and if there is people of color if that one person of color who can then you bring them into the board but that, that's an issue too because diversifying the board you know is it's, it's not necessarily having a token person in there who is going to agree with you and everything because it's going to be doing business with you and everything it's about the idea that you're trying to diversify the voice and the board about the work that you do and the performing arts. And then, again, we all know, right now everybody's going crazy in the theaters. I'm talking about theaters, getting an associate artistic director of color who has no power. It's just a title. No, give them power, give them a budget, give them a program, tell them, you, it, it, because if you have no power at all, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, I work in these institutions for years. I left institutions because of this issue, because I didn't want to fight inside the institution. I can do much more better. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's so much work to do. It, it's been incredible. And we have to push every day 
every day. It, it's been a struggle or say, why, why? In, in, or I was in a commission for the LA County Art, for the LA County, you know, and we kept one of the biggest budgets in the country. Right. And, you know, and so in our county, the county so was giving money to uh, the arts organizations in, in, in the LA, a hundred million dollars a year, which is really not a lot for the type of budget that we have, but who was going to four institutions, four white institutions, and another 300 nonprofits, arts and organizations were getting each one of meaning $80 million were annually going to these four institutions and $20 million were going to 400 art institutions. Right, so, so you see the imbalance right there. It's, it, it's in the funding. That's you know, right. one of the things that, that we've done is we feel very strongly uh, uh, on a couple of levels. First of all, um, our staff is very diverse, right? In this particular case, it happened to be me working with um, with this client, um, but we try to have the, the staff look like America. We have people of different ages, and ages is different. I was just talking with one of our, our colleagues, and, and she was saying, look, you know, frankly, the people who are older don't get it. The people who are younger get it, right? And the people who are older are, are, have their perspective, right? So they're also different perspectives. The other thing that we did, and I was talking about this with Jose Luis before you came on, Everett, is that from the very beginning, we uh, encourage clients to not use pedigree as a filter because pedigree contains systemic bias. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. How, how do you see that? Because you're both educators, right? Mm -hmm. You both actually award degrees. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you see that? Because what we've been trying to do from the very beginning, we, we've said search by results, not by pedigree. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. beyond the school suspects. Um, we've argued within clients. We also go to places where change is needed, where there are problems, right? We put ourselves into, into the middle of a battle and we stumbled in this case. How, Everett, how do you see it as someone who awards degrees in terms of this pedigree situation? <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm in education, obviously. So when I'm working with people of color who come from uh, maybe a, a, a disenfranchised background, I encourage them to get degrees because when you have degrees, then you have a status that that they can't take away from you. I mean, I remember when I first started teaching, going to um, a, at another university, and it was a white university. And as I walked into the classroom, you know, you had a white professor that says, "I am Doctor So and So," and the class would say, "Okay, that's great." I walk into the classroom, I say, "I am Doctor So and So." I'm Doctor McCorvey. Their first question is, "Okay, prove it." And I think that's the that's the difference that we've got to get out of the system so that everybody has the and, and this is what you're talking about, that pedigree versus experience. And uh, but a lot of people of color don't have the experience that they need because those doors haven't been opened for them yet and the opportunity for those doors. I know in opera companies now, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, more opera companies are looking at hiring DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion officers to help them to look into their company and figure out where the systemic racism is happening. Some companies, Houston, uh, uh, there are several uh, companies uh, in different parts of the uh, country that are now hiring uh, artistic administrators and of color to help them with the casting of opera. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera has just hired a diversity officer. So there are companies now because of Black Lives Matter, which is uh, amazing young people's movement. Uh, because of that, I think I call it the second civil rights movement, actually. I grew up doing the first civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where I'm from. And my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, I call this the second civil rights movement. And this one is fueled by young people 
and a lot of young white people who are looking at this situation and saying, this is not right. We've got to do better as a country. And so I look forward to organizations, nonprofits that continue to hire diversity, equity, inclusion officers and have training so that we can identify systemic racism as it's happening and remove that from the performing arts and the nonprofit uh, organizations. Go ahead, Mr. Lewis. Yeah, I mean, where, where do I begin? About, I don't have a degree. I don't have a terminal degree. I, I became famous in Europe. This is what I'm talking about. I was a director that I, I did a lot of work in Europe in my early age. I was involved with the Chicano movement in the United States, which was like the civil rights movement, you know, at the time, part of the civil rights movement. And it happened to be directing in major theaters around the nation and internationally. And the university called me to, to become uh, the head of the MFA directing program 25 years ago. Uh, you know, because he was the uh, UCLA School of Theater and Film Television is a professional school, you know, and, and uh, even though it's one of the greatest research universities in the world, these particular uh, uh, departments are professional schools. So it was only professional people who were in the field teaching. You know, it, that was an experience. But I, this is how bad the system is, okay? This is so funny. I just retired two years ago and I live in Los Angeles. We have a community in East LA that is, you know, we are 51% of the population. Again, I mean, in 25 years, I have five Latinos to be in my program. It, it, you know, it's totally impossible to get into these MFA programs. And I'll, we talk about what are the reasons. So I said, oh, I'm gonna work with my community college. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to work with my people. I'm going to work in the community. I'm going to offer a class. I'm going to go talk to them. I talk to the chancellor of the district. And I say, you know, I have these, 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 these classes about history. I've been doing, I'm a distinguished professor. And he knew me, who I was. He goes, oh, that's fantastic. So he goes, but you know, we need to hire you. I say, oh, you don't have to hire me. I have to figure out why I do the class. So you cannot be hired in a community college because you don't have an MFA. <laughs> so by that means, I say, I'm a distinguished professor, right? Why, why? Uh, uh, Agus Wilson will never be able to teach in a community college. He didn't have an MFA. Well, there, there you go, right? I mean, it's it, it's that use of pedigree to create a barrier. And and it's it, it's not out of ill will. That's the real reason that we, we argue against that. Even when we do university searches, we did a university search for our provost and executive uh, vice chancellor at the University of North Carolina um, School of the Arts. And you'll appreciate this. They did not create that barrier. The person who was um, uh, recruited was Patrick Sims, who comes out of the theater, an African-American man coming out of the University of Wisconsin. Right, the the avoidance of those barriers are so important. How do we create that consciousness that leads to not having that discussion, to having Jose Luis, somebody like yourself there, to to create the transformation? Because if there's a barrier to transformation, that's where it is. That's where I'm. I'm, I'm I mean, we need to change the system. I Meaning, we really have to go to the root of the system that it was based on racism. It was based on the idea. I mean, come on, this thing about artistic excellence. What do that? What's the meaning of that? What What do that means in the world? It, it's incredible to me that we still use it. But it, it, it you know, we still the idea that oh, you have to have artistic excellence, and who is the judge? Who is the judge about that? Uh, we have to, uh, what are you, now they, they use all these coded words in order, I mean, I, I, I'm in a meeting with a bunch of artistic directors and we're talking about diversity and I say, well, this is what you have to do. You have to hire people in your administration and put people of color in your board and I mean, this is the way you're gonna change it. And they go, they go but do they exist? <laughs> 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 
That is so true. I mean, you know, how many times have we heard, uh, well, we would like to hire someone of color, but we don't know anybody. Because we don't think they're out there. Right. And I'm saying, are you kidding me? Absolutely, they're out there. But again, it has to be intentional. It has to be something that people people are willing to say, I want to go out and search for the best people in this, uh, for this uh, position in all races. And uh, because uh, if somebody says to me that the person is not out there, my response typically is in my mind, you just don't want to work. And uh, because the people are out there. Well, there's, it, it goes, it, it goes so very deep. I have been you know, again, as I said, we've been, we go where the battles need to be fought. So we've gone to, um, to places where these issues have been avoided for centuries. And we have those discussions. We've been in environments in which we go around and we say, we look at museums and we say, look, all of the artists of color, they're, they're here, but they're all hung in hallways and in little corners. We've said that and you could hear a pin drop. We've, we've been in situations where uh, people have said, look, we'd like to have someone of color on the, someone of color on the, on the board, but, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, it's wealth and big checks or whatever, whatever the barrier is, right? We have those discussions and we function as advocates, but the change is there's so many different barriers I think we have to keep fighting, but let's talk about what, what needs to be done systemically. Let's talk about the board. Let's talk about the staff and let's talk about education. Do you want to start with education or do you want to start with, with board? Funding? Well, if you're, if you're talking about professional organizations, I think you have to start with the board uh, because uh, that is a very important place because the artistic director is going to uh, obey the will of the board. And so uh, if the board members are not diverse and there's not a diversity of thought from the board, then there's not going to be an artistic will to make changes at the uh, artistic level. So for me, I think that we have to start working at the board level to create a more diverse board. Jose Luis, how do you see yeah, it? No, yeah. Well, I think I think it's, it's in the board. Of course, I think we have to start with, but I wanna talk about the diversity of the board. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a board, I have a, a Latino board because I have a Latino organization you know, who does multicultural programming, but I have a Latino board. And the big institutions, the big museums, and then if I have two or three great board members, they come and take them away and put them in their institutions. Yeah? Now, this is board that are nurtured, that I got from the community, a businessman or, you know, an entrepreneur. And I said, you have to be in the world of the arts. And let's figure out, it takes years to nurture these board members. They move into these big organizations, now white organizations, and then they transform into this not community board because they supposedly they're professional boards who begins to say, no, you give me the hundred thousand dollars that I need you from the as you're committed, but you know, but you know, this is a business, and it goes through this circle. To, it's another, it's a business right now. This is a business and it's not necessarily an arts, uh, you know, the music center the, the, or, or LACMA. I say, I say, how is that a business? They lose millions of dollars every year. You know, they, they, they're subsidized by millions of dollars from the county and from the state and the federal funding. It, it's very easy for them to talk about being a business, you know, when uh, organizations of color are suffering for funding. And, th and they're taking away the great board members that can be in, 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 in organizations of color. So what you, your point is, is that um, it, is, it is fundamental in, in the funding models of, of how these organizations function. And we can change, you know, we can have a search firm that is diverse and has all sorts of different people and sensibilities. And even you can have artists and you can even have managers in there, but we really have to go down to the fundamentals and really query the entire model 
of how these, these organizations actually function. Is that, is that your take as well? Yeah. yeah, well, I think that one of the things that we can consider when you're working on diversifying your board is, uh, you know, a lot of boards, what they do is they look for people who have the financial resources to help keep the company afloat. But what I try to do with the boards, I have, I have, I work with three different boards in my three different organizations. And uh, what I try to do in all three of those organizations is to say, let's have a model where we have categories so that you do have some of those high dollar, uh, you know, if you have a, a board of, I'll just take another, you know, 12, you might have four or five who are high dollar uh, uh, board members, but you also may have one or two positions for accountants, one or two positions for bankers, one or two positions for community people, so that you'll have some people who don't have the financial resources to be particularly on a particular board, but what the other things that they bring to the board are just as important. And so uh, if you bring a community person that has a wide net of people that they uh, get to work with, that's as important as that person who has a lot of money that's on the board. So I think by having categories, you can always make sure that you have a place at the table for everyone in the community. You know, this is so interesting because this is exactly how Wikipedia functions. Um, we, we did a lot of transformational work at Wikipedia and Wikipedia does have exactly that, that approach. Um, we also just finished two polls. We're doing a third right now. The first poll had 96% uh, of the people thinking that there was an imbalance mm -hmm. um, for uh, uh, people of color. And then the second poll asked whether we need a fundamental change where we change everything all at once, a targeted change, which is on a time frame but very driven, or evolutionary change. And 56% of the people said uh, targeted change where there's a time frame, um, and 30% uh, said um, fundamental change. So we have basically 82% of the respondents. I mean, all all the people who responded said that change was necessary because that was the nature of the question. But 82% uh, uh, of the uh, the respondents felt that it was either fundamental or very driven change that is required. Um, let's talk a, a little. Everett, did you want to make another point? Well, I think that second poll is very interesting because if you if you think about that, that's really true. I mean, that's a great way of looking at. It. You have to have. That's saying we have to have short term change and we have to have long term change. And I think as organizations are looking. They shouldn't, they shouldn't try to plan to be to change everything all at once because you have to have that plan. It's like having a, a, a three-year uh, plan and a long-range plan of five years so that the organization over a period of time can make those important changes that need to be made. So I'm very excited about your audience because, uh, man, they are with it. Uh, I want to say... You guys, we have to look at the curriculum and the universities and institutions like that. It's all old, old fashioned. That needs to be changed. Meaning it's totally, you go to any arts education, there is no such, if there is a diversity class, it's like a, an elective. It's not part of the curriculum. They're not teaching. We're not teaching the young people the, the truth history. There is no canon that includes people of color and, and the arts and you know and all the arts and the visual arts and the performing arts. And, and it's, it is so, so crucial if we really wanna make it in the schools, the, 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 the educational system has to look at, at, at the curriculum of every university in this country and, and change that. That is going to create a change. And it was your point, right, uh, Jose Luis, August Wilson is my playwright. I need to learn his works, That's right? right. It's, it, so uh, I'm going to ask you one last question because we are coming to the end of our time, as you correctly point out. And I want to ask the question of tokenism. 
one of our viewers um, asked the question, and there is this issue of tokenism. Is DEI, the creation of a DEI office, does that sort of become the token thing, right? Is the, is the appointment of one person or two people on the board or creating reserved seats, is that the token that prevents change? Can we talk a little bit about that? Because we, we see, I, I, and you you put forth sort of a DEI office, Everett, at, as a valid approach. And then there are other people who think that's an invalid approach, that it's, that it's a brief that everyone should carry. I, I, uh, Everett, why don't you, you start because you're jumping out of your seat. And then I am because, you know, I, I just remember when I first started at the University of Kentucky, which is where I'm uh, teaching, um, I the, the local uh, student newspaper said, uh, interviewed me and they said, uh, well, how do you feel about being an affirmative action hire? Because, you know, back 30 years ago, it was affirmative action. And so they said, how do you feel about being an affirmative action hire? I said, I feel fine about that because I'm qualified. I know that I'm, I'm up to the task of this position. What affirmative action did was just open the door for people of color to have an opportunity. Once the door was open, it's still up to us to walk through the door and be successful. And so for me, if we choose, the, you know, I'm thinking 30 years now down the road, we're at DEI. So if that is going to open the door to identify systemic racism, I'm totally fine with that because the system, as Jose Luis says, the system needs to change. And the other thing that I'll say in terms of tokenism is that if you're going to hire at a university, hire more than one. You know, I always use the uh, adage at our university that Noah brought the animals into the ark two by two. And so if you're going to hire one, at least hire two so that they can talk. And because their experience is going to be very different from the majority experience in an institution. And so it, getting the numbers up is very, very important. Thank you. We started with you, Everett. Jose Luis, let's end with you. With you. Let's give you the final word. Yeah. Now, uh, talking about EDI and talking about the idea of tokenism and affirmative action, I, I think that, yeah, I think EDI, I think the discussion is so complicated and difficult. And we have to be un understand that we, uh, from now on, we're going to be in a room where we're going to be uncomfortable about what the conversation that this country is having, meaning we all have to understand that. What is what you're going through, Mark, is gonna happen every day to a lot of people in this country and, and the institution, especially in the nonprofit world. So I think it's important to understand EDI becomes a place where you can actually have a mediator in the idea of the conversation. I think that's why it's important because the conversation is gonna happen even if if nobody wants or not, it's happening now. And it's nothing but it's going to be, but, uh, but, but increase. So what's important I think with the ADI is that allows a platform for the conversation between the parties and being able to create a dialogue and not necessarily, it's, a, it's not an imposition because imposing something is not gonna change, nothing. It's the idea that we are going to introduce this new thought that the organization is changing and people are calling are going to rule. What a great, what a great thought. Jose Luis, uh, thank you so much. Artistic Director of the Latino Theater Center and Everett McCorvey, Professor and Director of Opera at the University of Kentucky College of Fine Arts. As for myself, I apologize again for uh, our errors. Um, you know, we play very close to this fire of change. And if you play close to the fire, you get burned. You get burnt and you get burnt and you get burnt. And we need to learn how to be close to that fire, handle it and not be consumed by it, yet still change. So thank you so much, you both, for helping to inform us, to inform me. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. Thank you. Thank you.